Uh, okay. Okay, it's recording now. Now, uh, before I begin, are there any questions? Uh, no, not. Okay. There yeah. Is yeah. Go, ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Any way we could get um, our grades posted thus far? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, I, no, I, I heard that. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not going to post the grade so far, but uh, my suggestion is if you have any questions or concerns, just email me directly. Okay? Yeah. So, Christine, you can just email me if you have any concerns, but, uh, you know, also same to anyone else. But, but in general, just keep in mind that, you know, like I said, um, the midterm itself is only a small fraction of the grade. So assuming that you do all your assignments properly, I would say all, all of you will do fine. Um, but again, just, yeah, just uh, email me directly. Okay. Great. Okay. So let's begin because today's lecture is, uh, is quite interesting, but, but it's also somewhat complicated. So we should try to go through it a little carefully. Um, so this is the idea of statistical ray optics. So first, let's try to understand why we need to study something like this. So the reason is simple. The reason is we are trying to essentially improve the performance of a solar cell. So I want you to do a practice, a brainstorm for a couple of minutes. Uh, Narayan will, uh, will guide you. But let's first think, and, and before you do this, let's first think about what a solar cell is. A typical, typical solar cell looks like this. It has a p-n junction, so it's a p-type semiconductor right next to an n-type semiconductor, and it is usually biased. Um, and this is where the current flows through. Uh, sun, light comes in, and these photons that have energy higher than the band gap of the silicon or the semiconductor that's used essentially creates electron hole pair. So holes are created here, electrons are created here. And because this PN junction is the reverse biased, which is the, con which is the con uh, typical operating um, condition for a solar cell, these holes here essentially get swept across and the electrons here swept across. And the electrons essentially flow through the outside circuit and the holes flow through the outside circuit, creating current. And that current is essentially where, where you get the power, you get work done. This current can be used to drive a motor, it can be used to light a lamp or, or whatever. It can be used to charge a battery. So I want you first, before we go and in, dive into this, think about this as a system from a very conceptual point of view and spend about a minute brainstorming how do you think you can improve this? Not And don't think about this from an uh, electronics point of view, but from a foot photons, uh, optics point of view. So let's, let's, I want you um, to talk to your neighbors and spend roughly a minute on this. Think about lights coming in and it's creating these electron hole pairs and it's, it's just creating a current through the load. So I'm going to stop here for, let's say about a minute and you, you guys can discuss, but think how you would improve it. It could be a concentrator, for example, it could be something you do to the cell, it could be anything else. So just try to list them out. And Irene, maybe you can uh, guide them a little bit. And the reason I want you to think is because it will make the motivation for what we are doing a bit more apparent. So well, while we are waiting, uh, I suppose, uh, does anyone have any suggestions? If you, if you talk loudly, I can hear it, so. <laughs> you can um, change the material to make it more like photons, or you can do a multi-junction. Yes, that's true. That's a good suggestion. So the, the, the two points that you raised, one, um, is that you could change the material so you absorb more light. And that's exactly what we will talk about today. 
The second thing you mentioned, which is using a multi-junction cell, we will not talk about today. It's a subsequent lecture. Um, right, any, any other ideas? Any, anyone else? Anti-reflection? Yes, excellent, yes, absolutely. So what is anti-reflection? In other words, uh, let's think about what's going on. Light's coming in here, and we want all the light to go inside here, which is where it's absorbed. But of course, because this is silicon, it acts like a mirror. Some of the light will let us escape off the top. So if we could do some kind of anti-reflection coding here, which allows, minimizes the light loss by reflection, of course that will help. That's excellent, and we will also talk about this in a in a lecture in a in a few, in a couple of lectures down. Any, anything else? Okay, uh, I guess that's good. So, so you identified two very important things, which, by the way, are critical for making solar modules today commercial modules. And these two advancements that you identified are very, very important. We'll un try to understand them. Now, what we're going to do today is after we gain some motivation as to why we need to understand this, we are going to try to gain some intuitive understanding of how to study and how to design uh, these kinds of things to improve the performance of solar. So let's dive right in. So what we want to do is we want to somehow change the material, in today's lecture anyway, to absorb more light, which means we want to create complex shapes, complex surfaces, okay? which means that we need to understand the optics of complex surfaces. And because our main goal is on geometrical optics, we will look at the geometrical optics of complex or random surfaces or shapes. Okay? And this is a field called statistical ray optics. And in today's lecture, um, oh, actually, before we go into that, um, uh, let's go through the motivation of why this is the case. So I won't go play this video, but uh, I'll post a link to it on our website because it's a little long, but you can look at it. This gives you a, an idea of what is the highest efficiency solar module available today. And it kind of looks like that. Uh, so let me can zoom in. I won't play the video. But you can see it's, it's very clear. There are no uh, grid lines here, for example. And we'll talk about why that's important in a second. But this is kind of the module from SunPower. It's, uh, this particular one was from Germany, which has an efficiency of about 22% at the module level, which is kind of the world record. They, they have the Guinness Book of World Records efficiency. Uh, and you can look at the video to see the, the various things, but let's look at in, a, in a bit more detail at how it gets its efficiency, okay? And that can be seen approximately here. They call this technology a maxion cell technology, and let's see what it looks like. So first of all, this blue part is the silicon where the light is absorbed. Okay, so the, this, this sandwich here is basically one of these squares. Okay, so they have essentially split it apart. So the silicon is here in blue. And first thing you'll notice is that there is nothing on top. Okay, it's, it's, of course it's protected by glass. Um, so there's a glass uh, cover on top, but there are no contact lines on top. Most so solar cells, if you actually look at them, you will see little lines running through them. Okay, so there are no wires on top to block the sunlight. And this is very important, which means that you can absorb more of the light. Second thing they did, they put a backside mirror, which is shown here. And all it does is that the light comes in and it bounces off, which means that the light now gets a chance to pass through this absorber material twice. Comes in from the top, bounces off from the bottom, passes through it again. Okay, it reflects and essentially absorbs more light. And then also at the bottom, the contacts are all at the bottom and we'll see how that works in the next uh, slide, but they tend to make them very thick plated co copper contacts, which basically reduces the contact resistance. So you can avoid uh, contact resistance losses, so you get more power out. So they engineered this very, very, um, in a very optimal fashion. Now we can look at the PN junction in a bit more detail as shown here. 
So before we go here, let's start from the bottom here. So the PN junction is not like a sandwich as we saw before, but in this case, they are laterally spaced. So you have a P here, you have an N here, N here, P here, and so on and so forth. And the contacts are at the bottom. So this is a positive contact, negative contact, positive contact, negative contact, and so on and so forth. And by the way, that's what these copper contacts are connecting to. Now, of course, because all the contacts at the bottom, there are no wires on the top to block the light. So that's one very important advance. The second thing they did was that they texturized the surface here. And this is a critical thing we'll talk about today. The light comes in, because of this texture here, it will basically randomize the light as it goes inside. And it, of course, also reflects off the bottom contacts in this bottom reflector, which uh, you can see here. And it allows the light to essentially bounce around in this material many, many, many times, increasing the probability that it will be absorbed. So that's the key idea that we want to talk about here. So the question we want to answer is, this texturization increases the efficiency of the solar cell quite a lot. The question is, how do we analyze this from an optics point of view? Because it's a complicated structure. It's very, you know, if you start doing ray tracing of the structure, it can get very complex very, very quickly. So how do you think about this? How do you design these structures? That's our goal here. Okay, so we need to understand some basic principles and we are going to look at some thermodynamics. So it's a little bit abstract and a little bit of mathematics, but uh, let's try to go through it carefully. So most of today's lecture will rely on a very important paper, which is also posted on the website called Statistical Ray Optics. It was written by um, Eli Blanovich, um, who's actually well known for uh, other things like photonic crystals, but he wrote this paper in the early 80s. Um, he was at Exxon Research and Engineering, as you can see, but uh, today he's a professor at Berkeley. Uh, he's uh, one of those people who have been nominated for the Nobel Prize uh, several times and so on, for other things as well, not, not, not just this. But the idea here is that he developed some mathematical as well as intuitive understanding of how to think about these random structures. And his particular goal was to try to optimize the performance of solar cells. He also in this paper talks about anti-reflection coatings, which we will talk about in one of the subsequent lectures. So let's try to understand what this means. So let's imagine a sheet, okay, of a refractive index N. It can change with position, so it can be N of X. Now this sheet is textured on both sides as shown here. And it is essentially sitting in vacuum with this, which has a black body radiation. So, so a system is simply this textured sheet of refractive index N immersed in a black body radiation. The question we want to answer is, for a given intensity of black body radiation outside the sheet, what is the intensity inside the sheet? Okay, that is the goal here. Because if you think about it, this is approximately the situation um, that we are trying to understand in the case of the solar cell. And we can address this problem from an, a, a thermodynamics point of view. And we saw some of this in one of our earlier lectures, but um, again, you don't need to know the mathematics, but let's just go through it briefly and gain some intuition. So first of all, we assume thermal equilibrium, which means that the sheet is at the same temperature as the surroundings. Okay, under thermal equilibrium, the electromagnetic energy density is given by Planck's formula, and it's something complicated here. The U is the electromagnetic energy density. Okay, it depends upon the frequency, temperature, and so on and so forth. Okay, and some constants like K, is, in this case, a Boltzmann constant. Um, and uh, this K, which is a little confusing, by the way, is the uh, wave number. So they, they should really use different terms, but anyway, yeah, it's approximate. It's, it, it's, it's given here. Now, the intensity itself at any location in this uh, system is given by the electromagnetic energy density multiplied by what's called the group velocity of the photon. Okay? And again, I won't go into the, the theory behind all this, but you'll get an expression which looks like that. Now, what we want to compare is the intensity outside and the intensity inside. Okay, that's all we care about. And this is, can be thought of as the intensity enhancement. So intensity outside is simply this expression with N equal to one. Okay, whereas intensity inside is this expression with N equal to N. 
and everything else is exactly the same because the temperature is the same for both materials. The frequency of the photons are the same. Speed of light is the same. Everything else is the same. So the only difference is the Z squared. So from this very simple expression, we know the intensity inside the sheet is n squared times larger than the intensity outside because the, intensity, the refractive index outside is one. Yeah, and that's the conclusion. The intensity within a medium in thermal equilibrium with a black body radiation is n squared times higher than its environment. Or I internal is n squared times I external. And ignore the other super um, sp scripts. But that's the key fundamental idea that comes from thermodynamics. Just to repeat again, the intensity of light within a material of refractive index n is n squared times the intensity of light outside that material, assuming that outside means uh, vacuum or air. Okay. There, the, the key assumption we have to make in order to make that statement is that the behavior of light rays is ergodic. Ergodic essentially means that the rays are random. And this is critical. If they're not random, what we just said is not quite true. Now, what does it mean by ray, light, behavior of light rays is random? It means that once the ray enters a particular medium, it forgets where and in which direction it came from. It forgets the history, okay? So a ray of light comes in from the outside to the inside. It completely doesn't matter where it came from, but it, com it can go in any direction inside the material as possible. Okay, this is, can be also thought of like a statistical randomness. And it's a very important idea. And if, it, it, to look at it from a schematic, if you have collimated light coming in, let's say from sunlight, from far away, which is at a given angle here. After it passes through this textured surface, it can refract, reflect, reflect again. And after these multiple reflections inside, the light becomes completely randomized. In other words, the direction here is all, almost completely uncorrelated to the direction that it came in. And that's what that means by ergodic behavior. Okay, so the idea is that the, the intensity inside this material can be n squared times the intensity outside as long as the rays are ergodic. That, they, that is, they forget their initial direction after one or two reflections, statistically averaged over the area of interest. Also keep in mind that the ray is not just a single point here, it's spread over some area, right? So it averages over all these regions here, but when it uh, refracts, reflects, does multiple reflections and so on. So think again about a beam of light from the sun, for example, entering this surface, which is random, and getting trapped inside the surface by bouncing around and essentially becoming completely random. And if that situation is true, then the intensity of light inside that material is now n squared times larger than the intensity of light that came in from the outside. Okay, which is a very profound idea if you, if you really think about it. And there are some very interesting physics behind all this, but for us, what's important is to gain that intuition. Okay, and, uh, and this understanding, of course, is critical to designing that surface randomized texture that we saw before for the best uh, high efficiency solar cells. Is there a question? Okay, so another thing one can of course do, and we saw this in the, in, the, in the high efficiency solar cell, is that you can place essentially a reflector at the bottom. So imagine light coming in and you have these text textured surfaces and this is the material, and you can basically put a reflector at the bottom. And what it, what it does is that of course light comes in and bounces around, gets randomized, but some light escapes, right, because of uh, refraction. And whatever escapes can essentially be reflected back into the system by a mirror at the bottom, okay? And if you can do that very efficiently, then you can allow the light to pass through twice. So the light gets an additional pass, which means that you get an additional factor of two here. So it's not just n squared anymore, it's two n squared. 
So the intensity inside is twice n squared times the intensity outside. Okay. And clearly in the champion solar cells, this is exactly what people do. Okay, what are the key caveats? So this is only true under the uh, realm of geometrical optics, first of all, which means that the, the films have to be optically thick. And this means that the thickness of the film is larger than lambda over 2n, okay? And if you assume a wavelength of one micrometer and refractive index of 3.5, which is for silicon, lambda over 2n is one, one micron divided by seven. That's about 140 nanometers. So it's pretty thick. I mean, pretty thin, sorry. So what is the smallest thickness this theory might be valid? For in this particular case, it's 140 nanometers. That's very thin. So in other words, this theory is valid for most cases. Most solar cells are, of course, much thicker than 140 nanometers. They're usually thicker than several microns or tens of microns. In this situation, how, let's think about how much enhancement intensity is possible. We said that the enhancement is 2n squared, right? n squared is roughly 3.5 times 3.5. It's, let's say, about 10. Two times that, it's about 20. So that means in intensity, just from doing this surface texturing and putting a mirror at the bottom, increases inside the silicon by a factor of more than 20 times than, if it's, than the intensity outside the silicon. That's a very significant enhancement. Certainly worth doing, okay? And of course, this is what they do in most uh, good solar cells today. Now, another point on ergodic behavior can also be, uh, intuition can begin by thinking of a billiard table. So if you have a billiard table, which is a rectangle, you can see because of this very high symmetry that uh, the billiard balls can really only follow two different angles because of the symmetry of this rectangle. And, and that's indicated here. So it's one times two, that two bounces here, two times three, three bounces and so on. And it tells you the number of degrees of freedom that you can get. And you can keep going. But the key is that the number of angles accessible for a given ray is only two. Okay, you can launch the ray any way you want, but the angle that it follows is never more complicated than two values. Okay, in other words, if you launch it here, you can only have these two angles, right? This reflection angle, this reflection angle. If you launch it at a different angle, you'll see one angle here, another angle here, and then it's a, it repeats, which is shown here. Okay, because of this high symmetry, you can only get two angles, which means that a billiard ball is not ergodic. Okay, it's not random. So in order to randomize it, we need to go to more complicated polygonal tables. So if you make a triangle, you can get randomized quickly. If you make a square, it's not random. If you make a hexagonal, it's, it's more random. So the more sides you have, or uh, it depends, of course, it, it depends on how you reduce the symmetry. For example, a circle is not a card at all. But this is a very simple analogy because light is actually not like billiard balls. And most importantly, our systems are not closed. Light can escape if the incident angle is smaller than the critical angle. And we'll talk about that today. In other words, if this is the ray of light, it comes here. If this angle is smaller than the critical angle between these two surfaces, the light can refract out. Okay? So there is an escape path, whereas in a billiard table, it's a closed system. And that's explained here. So let's take a very simple example. And this is actually an example you'll come to uh, next week uh, when we talk about LEDs, by the way. So imagine a, a, a point source here which is emitting light. Okay, it's going in all directions. Imagine this ray of light. This ray is coming this way, and this is a higher index material, that's air. So this angle of incidence is now larger than the critical angle, which means that it's totally internally reflected. Okay, same as this angle, which means that all these angles, which are, lar uh, have la which are larger than the critical angle, are essentially trapped in this, and they propagate in this direction like a waveguide. Okay, 
But those, look at this ray, which is incident at an angle which is smaller than the critical angle, it escapes, okay, by refraction. So this cone, which is defined by these black dashed lines, represent what's called the escape cone, or the air cone. This is the cone of light that will escape out from inside the semiconductor. It can also escape into the bottom if you have a, substra a transparent substrate. In this case, because the refractive index difference is smaller, the escape cone is larger. Okay, now of course the critical angle we all know is given by sine theta c is one over n, one being air, n being the refractive index of material. The solid angle subtended by the escape cone as a fraction is usually quite small. So the solid angle of a whole uh, sphere is four pi. The escape cone is simply one over n, two n squared which is the solid angle of this escape cone. Again, you have two sides, so there's a factor of two. So the fraction of light that escapes is simply four pi divided by two n squared. And you can think about this as the probability that any light ray, which is equally, uh, it, can it can be emitted in any direction, escapes the medium. Okay, the probability that a light ray inside the medium will escape is small or a small amount of randomness is required to create ergodic behavior. So what does that mean? That means that if I essentially introduce a little bit of texture in this flat surface, these rays that would have otherwise escaped, it's highly likely they will get trapped. They will essentially reflect back in. That's basically what that means. So the conclusion from an intuitive sense is that even a small amount of texturing can drastically increase the amount of light that can be trapped within the semiconductor slab. Okay, and then we'll try to understand this mathematically. Okay, so uh, let's consider an interface as shown here, okay? So this is the interface of the textured surface. We're zooming in to one point here. This side is the refractive index end, that side is air, so light's coming in incident, okay, that's the normal to the surface, that's the incident angle, and it's refracted, okay, as expected, it goes closer to the normal because it's a higher refractive index material, and this is the incident intensity, that's the internal intensity, okay, and theta is the refracted angle, phi is the incident angle. Now, we're also going to consider a small infinitesimal area of this interface dA here, Okay, and the critical angle is theta c. So theta is, of course, less than theta c as expected. And that's also can be considered the last cone. Now, back here, there is another interface where this ray is going to reflect off and could potentially come back. And if it comes back within this last cone, it can escape. But if it comes back outside the last cone, it is trapped, at least for that particular reflection event. Okay, so our goal here is to compute what is the probability of the light that is trapped? Or what is the fraction of light that is trapped? Okay, so let's start with the following. A fraction of light that is transmitted from the outside in, it can be thought of as T incident, T I N C. And it's a function of phi, okay? And typically that number is very large, 90, 95%, uh, okay? Because that's basically dependent on, upon any reflection losses, which are usually relatively small less than 10%, let's say. So now how do we compute how much light is trapped here is we apply essentially a, 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 something called a balance uh, equation or a detailed balance equation, which is very simple, it's common sense. Basically it says that the transmitted light which is coming into the system must be balanced by the light that escaped, okay? which is the principle of thermal equilibrium. So the material is in thermal equilibrium with the surroundings, which means that any light that came in, the energy should be equal to the energy of the light that escaped, or power, okay? And this principle is also called the detail balance. So we'll apply this principle with a little bit of mathematics. So first of all, we need to come up with an expression for the intensity of light inside the material, okay? First we assume it's isotropic, which means that it doesn't vary with direction. It's essentially given by an integral of the internal intensity per unit internal solid angle, which is this B int int multiplied by cosine theta d omega. 
Now, cosine theta, if you look here, is simply the projection of this area based on this direction. Okay, so that's the projection loss which we have seen before. And we can also, uh, d omega, which is the differential solid, uh, small solid angle, can also be written as sine theta d theta. And I won't go into the details of this, but this just comes from the geometry of solid angles. Okay, and this integral can also be, <clears throat> goes from zero to 90 degrees for theta. And clearly, as you can see, zero to 90 degrees is the whole thing. Okay, and you have a factor of two here, so to account for both sides, which is right there. Actually, this two. So two pi times integral zero to pi over two times this. This factor of two comes from the extra pass due to the, due to the reflective back surface, which is actually not shown here, but you can imagine there's a reflective back surface as we saw before. So there's this two. Okay, when you do this integral, it actually turns out to be very simple. Inter the, the I int is basically two pi times P int. Okay. Okay, so that is the intensity inside the material. Now we need to compute what is the intensity of light that escapes. The intensity of light that escapes, I escape, is simply 2 pi times the same integral as before, except now that we only integrate up to the critical angle. So that is how much light is within this escape cone or loss cone. Okay, and, and we also add a... a <clears throat> a transmission factor, which is basically T escape, which is the probability um, of uh, light, uh, transmission uh, efficiency of the light that, that would escape. Again, it's a function of theta. But if you define a, an angle average to escape transmission, it can come out of the integral, and you can do this integral. And what you end up with is basically <clears throat> I escape equals I int divided by 2n squared times T bar escape, which is essentially a constant. So we can even assume that's one for the sake of argument. So now we have a nice expression, okay? We have, by the way, the intensity that's escaping related to the intensity inside the material, okay? So now we can apply the tail balance. Light in equals light out. So light in is simply the transmission of the incident light multiplied by the incident intensity, okay? Function of feed. Light out is simply the, uh, the, the transmission efficiency average over all angles multiplied by the, uh, the, the intensity of the light that escapes, which is I int divided by 2n squared, as we just saw. So the very simple expression, you put it together, I int the internal intensity, which is what we're trying to do when compute, is simply 2n squared times this ratio times incident intensity. Okay, now let's think about this for a second. So internal intensity is 2n squared times incident intensity, which is now familiar to us, right? Now what is this thing here? This thing here suggests, first of all, that if this ratio is larger than one, that means I can increase my intense, incident intens, internal intensity larger than 2n squared times the incident intensity. Uh, this factor here, can be shown to be one for black body or isotropic radiation. So for most situations of interest, this is one, which means that we go back to what we saw before. The internal intensity is simply 2n squared times the incident intensity. But just uh, this is interesting that you can have potentially go higher than that, and it is possible only if you restrict the incident angle. This is, for example, what happens when you have concentration. So if you have concentration of light, this factor goes up. I will talk about this later on. But of course, you have to give something up. And when you get, what you give up is basically you restrict the amount of acceptance angle that you can get, as we saw in the lecture on the compound parabolic concentrator. Okay. But in most cases of interest that we are going to talk about today, where there is no concentrators, this is the situation. Okay, 2n squared times science. Okay. Now, let's use this understanding to do design and also analyze how to um, uh, light trapping, how to achieve light trapping in photovoltaics. And you will see more detail of this next week as well, but let's try to gain some basic understanding first. So what does light trapping mean in a, in a conceptual sense? So uh, first let's consider various situations shown here. One is simple uh, parallel 
plate slab, okay? So high refractive index immersed in air. If you have a ray of light coming in, it refracts and it refracts out because these two surfaces are parallel, the inc uh, incident light and the outgoing light are the same light, same um, angle, and there is no enhancement. Okay, there's nothing special here. It's what we're all used to. If I simply put a mirror at the bottom, the light comes in, refracts, reflects, and refracts off. So I got more of the light inside the material. So here I only have this much. Here I have from here to here to here. So which means that the probability of the light being absorbed is higher here because it is passing through more of the material compared to here. And I can do even more. I can essentially put like a periodic structure on the top, which for example, for this ray, it refracts in, totally internally it reflects down, reflects again and refracts out. So I've increased the path a little bit more. So there's a little bit here, a little bit more, a little bit more. This is a little bit more of the path of light in the material, which increases the probability of its absorption. I can go one step further, make a random texture. So what happens here, light comes in, refracts down, reflects off. There's some reflection, some uh, reflection here, refracts back, reflects down again reflex again. So now you can get many more reflections. And of course, you get a lot more optical path length within the material, much higher probability of it being absorbed. Now compare this to this. Okay. You can of course go one step further, you can texturize both surfaces. So you have a texture here and you have a mirror that textured and you get lots of things going on. So you have light that refracts in, reflects off, reflects multiple times, reflects again, reflects multiple times, reflects again, it could escape. Again, compare this to this. What you see is that by texturing the surfaces, you're allowing the light to essentially bounce around in this material many, 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 many times. And essentially by doing that, you allow the material to absorb the light more efficiently. Or in other ways, Think about it, you increase the probability that this light will be absorbed by allowing the light to bounce around in that material. So that's the key idea from a very intuitive point of view. And if you look at most of the solar cells that are sold today, you will see random textures which look like this. So these electron uh, micrographs from actual solar cells. You can see them, they can look like pyramids, they can look at like random structures as shown here. And there are various different ways people make these. Of course, they try to make these as low cost as possible from a manufacturing point of view. And um, we will talk a little bit about this next week. So another reason to do light trapping is that it allows one to use thinner solar cells, okay? Uh, because you allow the light to bounce around to many times, which means that you don't need the usual very thick solar cells. Now, typically solar cells are very thick. They're like 100, 200 microns uh, of thickness, which, you know, which you've all seen solar cells that are these um, rigid uh, silicon wafers. But if you make them very thin, let's say one micron or a couple of microns, they can actually become flexible. So some of you might have seen flexible solar cells. Those are basically these very thin cells. Um, and thin cells, of course, will and, uh, um, the performance of thin cells can be significantly enhanced by using light trapping. Uh, thin cells can also be cheaper because you use less material if the material is expensive. Sometimes they can have higher quality semiconductor because they have less material. You can essentially make this material to be better quality, uh, fewer defects and less carrier recombination. Um, and there are other reasons to do this, which actually you will talk about in the next lecture as well. Now, so far we haven't considered what happens if there is absorption. So we didn't, when we talked about the material uh, and enhancement of intensity and so on, we ignored the fact that there is any absorption going on in the material. So what happens if you introduce absorption? Now, of course, absorption is important because the, your goal is to absorb the light. If you don't absorb the light, then why do it, right? So you need to incorporate absorption into a model. And, and fortunately, it's relatively simple. So let's think about the same system that we've seen so far. And just to 
reminders of what that system is, it is basically this. Okay, you have some textured surface, this back surface is not shown, lights coming in and it's bouncing around and escaping and so on and so forth. So coming back here, um, the input light, you have they have a familiar thing here, incident intensity, and this is also familiar, which is the transmission efficiency. Now we introduce a new thing, which is the area, area of the incident light. So if you multiply the area, the incident intensity, and the transmission efficiency, that gives me the total power. Keep in mind that this is meter squared, this is watts per meter squared, this is efficiency, that's percentage. So meter squared times watts per meter squared gives me watts. So this is power, okay, power. Now light will escape at a rate that is given by the escape intensity which we saw before which is I in internal intensity divided by 2n squared times t bar escape we saw this before multiplied by the area of the escape so this is the power that escapes through the escape cone some light could be absorbed at the interface during reflection back because total internal reflection although theoretically is 100 percent efficient that's not always the case you could have some absorption that happens at this interface and this can be computed, again, not too complicated. You basically have a, the area of reflection, uh, internal intensity, then all these terms, which is cosine theta is projection factor, sine theta, d theta is the, is the solid angle, d omega. And eta is now the fractional absorption. You do the integral just like before, 0 to pi over 2, and you get a relatively simple expression, eta over 2, area of reflection, multiplied by the intensity, internal intensity. Okay, and the last thing that happens, of course, is that some of the light is absorbed in the bulk silicon, in the semiconductor. And to compute this, it's also not too complicated. All you need is a new thing called an absorption coefficient alpha, which is the amount of light that is absorbed per unit length. So you take the absorption coefficient, multiply by the intensity inside the material, so the internal one. You multiply by the volume element that you're integrating over, and you have a d omega, by 2 pi. Now this 2 pi comes from this uh, d omega here. Now, and uh, this integral, if you do it over all the 4 pi star radians, you will end up with the uh, expression here. For the, so in this particular case, you take out alpha L, you're assuming a, an average thickness of the material, alpha is independent of the solid angle, it's just the material properties comes out of the integral. You're assuming the I internal intensity is also isotropic, so it comes out of the integral, and the area of the incident light also comes out. So it just becomes a simple expression, you integrate it, you get something which looks like that, which is basically two alpha L A internal times A incident. Okay, so now you have an expression for everything. Input light, escaping light, absorbed light at the interface, absorbed light in the book. You put them all together in detailed balance. Okay, light in equals light out. So light in is simply that, what's coming into the system, incident. Light out is basically what escapes and what's absorbed at the reflection interface and what's absorbed in the bulk. Very simple, okay, you make them equal under thermodynamic equilibrium, you get an expression for the internal incident intensity and the internal incident intensity, so it's, it's here. Okay, it looks a little complicated, but we can simplify it. So, first of all, let's try to remember what are we trying to do. We are trying to increase the absorption of the solar cell, which means that we need to compute how much energy, is, how much power is absorbed in the solar cell, which is, as we saw before, is this thing here. Okay, how much light is absorbed in the bulk. So we compute that first, because that's what we're interested in. Okay, so basically multiply this with this term here, and you get that. Now what, you, what we want to do is we want to understand this much is absorbed in the bulk, how much is, of light is coming in? In other words, what is the fraction of incoming light that's absorbed in the bulk? So all you do is you take this and divide it by what's coming in. A incident, I incident. Okay, and you get something which looks like that. Now from this we can make some very simple uh, estimations. For example, if you assume that all the areas are equal, you can cancel these AAs. And, and you also assume that T incident and T escape are approximately equal. 
those can cancel out approximately as well. If the absorption is zero, for example, it'll get the same expression as before. In other words, 2n squared. Okay, so you can actually do this yourself. Uh, and you ignore it. If you ignore it, I equal zero, uh, set alpha equals zero, you'll basically get 2n squared, which is the same as before. Uh, of course, when you do alpha equals zero, you have to be careful because it's an alpha on the top and alpha on the bottom. So you just have to uh, be careful how you uh, do the, 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 the calculus. But you can show it's the same. But what is important is that we can do the following. We can look at the case of weak absorption, which is uh, in the case of silicon, it's, it's true because silicon is what's called an indirect band gap semiconductor. And you will know more about what indirect and direct band gap is in the next lecture. But from our point of view at this point, what it means is that alpha is small. It's not, a, it's not a strong absorber, it's a weak absorber. You can also assume that the eta is small. Remember, eta is the um, fraction of light that's absorbed at the interface during reflection. And this can be made small by, by controlling the quality of the silicon when it's manufactured. Okay. This means that the fractional absorption due to imperfect reflections is small. It's also the ideal case. So th those things, this goes away, this becomes small. You can also uh, assume that the, 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 the transmission in, in the escape cone is approximately equal to the transmission in the incident cone, the incident light. And that's a reasonable as approximation because there's really no difference between them in, if you think about the way the light is transmitting. And if you make the assumptions, you can get the maximum absorption enhancement is two times two n squared. And this extra two comes from the uh, angle averaging which comes from, the, again, the fact that you have a reflector at the bottom, which is 4n squared. So it's a very significant enhancement. So earlier we saw that the intensity of light inside a textured material is 2n squared larger than the intensity of light outside. Now we are so showing that if you have a weak absorber and make some simple assumptions, the absorption of light inside this material can be enhanced by four and squared times compared to the case when there is no texture. Now that's a very significant number because N, as you know, for silicon is 3.5, you square it's roughly 10 or 11, four times that is over 40. That's a big, big increase. Okay, so that's why this is a big deal. Now let's really think about what these things mean in an actual uh, uh, material and how they actually verified this. Okay, so in, in this paper, they did, uh, yeah, Eli actually did some experiments and you can see how, how it's done. It's a very simple experiment, by the way. Uh, what he did was he took a silicon wafer, okay, which was polished on two sides. There was two silicon wafers. One silicon wafer was polished on two sides. The other silicon wafer was roughened on one side and polished on the other side. And he put both of them against a white surface, like a mirror, okay, a reflector. And then he put essentially what's called an integrating sphere. An integrating sphere is nothing other than like a power meter, which essentially absorbs all the light that comes back from the silicon in all angles. And, they, and it's not shown here, but there is an input to this integrating sphere, which in, in puts light into the, on top of the silicon. So anything that back reflects is absorbed by this integrating sphere, okay? So the polished side faces the light. The rear surface is either flat or textured, can be polished or textured, and he compares them both, and the reflected light is measured by the integrated sphere. And the results are pretty dramatic. So this plot, the solid line here, is the measured uh, backscattered light as a function of wavelength, okay? And this is the case where it's flat. Both sides are flat, so it's like a mirror, okay, conventional slab of silicon. As soon as he textures one side, you can see this whole thing drops. This curve is shown in this black line, a solid line. This drops, which means that the reflected light has decreased. So where has that light gone? It's absorbed by the silicon. Okay, because silicon doesn't transmit this light, it gets absorbed. So this is a drop shows that silicon absorption has increased. Another thing which have, happens, which is also very important for solar cells, the absorption band is redshifted. In other words, it goes to longer wavelengths, which means that you can absorb more of the light that comes in. Just to notice that the dashed line is theory and the solid lines experiment, they agree reasonably well. 
So uh, this is actually experimental proof that what we're talking about is actually real. It's not just mathematics. So the last example I want to talk about in this class is the example, uh, also very important and very interesting example of granular silicon sheets. What does this mean? Very simple. What this means is that imagine little micro particles of silicon, okay, little balls of silicon shown here, which are embedded in a large um, plastic sheet. Give me the type of plastic, okay, such that the area occupied by silicon is less than 50%, let's say, of the total area of the sheet. Okay, so imagine a plastic sheet with little bits of silicon embedded inside it. So incident light comes in, one would expect most of the light just passes through. But because of this texturing introduced by this granular silicon, light gets trapped here. And this trapped light now gets absorbed by the silicon. So the conclusion that we will come to after the analysis is that the amount of light that's absorbed by the silicon is more than the area, the fraction of the area that's occupied by the silicon, which means that some of this light is trapped by this plastic and redirected to the silicon. A very, very important concept. We'll come back to this again. And also in this particular experiment, he also had a white backing to serve as a reflector. So the silicon microspheres were embedded in PMMA, which is a plastic. Light is trapped in silicon due to the higher refractive index enhancing absorption. That's the conclusion. To analyze this, is very straightforward as well. So let's apply detailed balance calculation in PMMA. So you have a situation for light comes from air to PMMA, which is this thing here. It goes from silicon to PMMA, which is this thing here, is equal to PMMA to air, which is this thing here and PMMA to silicon, which is this thing here. The one represents air, two represents silicon, three represents PMMA. And you can work through this, it's exactly what we did before, except that now you have two different, three different materials. You can also apply the detailed balance calculation inside the silicon. So you have light coming from air to silicon, plus PMMA to silicon, that should be balanced by the loss of silicon to air and from silicon to PMMA and absorption inside silicon. So your third term. So those are these, this is uh, air to silicon, PMMA to silicon, silicon to air, silicon to PMMA, and absorption within silicon. This is a familiar absorption coefficient as we saw before. Now goal is to solve this simultaneous system of equations for how much fraction of light that's absorbed. That's the idea, okay? Of course, the unknowns here, as you, as you can imagine, are I2, I1, actually the fraction of I2 and I1. Okay, so the unknowns clearly are I2, I1, and I3. I1 is known. Sorry, I2 and I3 are the unknowns. I1 is known because I1 is an incident input intensity. And we won't go through the mathematics, but let's throw some numbers at it. So first, we can put in some fractal indices in two of silicon 3.5, and three of PMMA is 1.5. Uh, the, the Transmission from one to two air to silicon is about 96%, let's say with a good anti-reflection coding, which is ARC. You can now compute that the intensity inside silicon is that. Okay, this can be thought of as a, a transmitted light intensity inside the silicon after the enhancement. Okay, now we can again put in some numbers. Let's imagine this is, we're thinking of within the band gap of silicon and alpha is small or close to zero. So let's ignore this term then we get a number which is two and two squared times I one. That's a pretty large number because of this 0 0.03 at the bottom here. This and two is of course refractive silicon, it's over 40. So the intensity in cell silicon is over 40 times the incident intensity. Very important, okay? And this is the experiment that shows this. So this is the measurement. Again, the system is the measurement experiment is exactly like this. He basically places the granular sheet here in between the white surface and the integrating sphere and the result is shown here. So if you don't have silicon, no granules, a uh, large factor of the light is reflected. You get 100%, very large number. But with the silicon granules, you see a huge drop. And this drop is because all the light has been absorbed within the silicon. And that's again wavelength. Okay, so uh, just to conclude, we talked about 
a, an approach to study statistical ray optics, which is the geometrical optics of very complex random surfaces. And we showed by do, applying these random texturing on surfaces and I'm using a back reflector, we can drastically increase the absorption of light within thin solar cells. Okay, we'll see this in more detail next week. And um, we looked at two particular examples. One was just a, a, a thin silicon slab with, with texturing on both surfaces. And one was the silicon granules embedded inside a PMMA sheet. Okay, so we'll stop here. And uh, I want you to, um, uh, when you get a chance, look and read through that paper um, and look at the mathematics a little more carefully than what we did in the lecture today because it's a little abstract. It takes a little bit of thinking and, and, and going through carefully. So uh, I'm going to stop here. And uh, but before we end, I also want to make a quick announcement about the third assignment. But before I do that, let's, uh, let me stop and see if there are any questions first. Okay. No questions. Okay. So the um, third, and, third assignment, of course, is due November 17th in class. And uh, the key goal for you, for you is to make a technical case for innovation. So this is, the goal, this is the, your opportunity to show, uh, to utilize the tools that you've learned in your class and apply to your specific project to demonstrate, first of all, your understanding. Second, to show to yourself that you have gained some skills that you can now apply to some realistic problem, okay? And what does that mean? That means you can do several things, as I had mentioned before. You can do some careful calculations, some theoretical analysis. You can do some numerical simulations. You can use light tools, as we talked about in this class. Um, you could uh, go a step further, build a hack together some prototype. Uh, it could even be a mock-up. It could be a prototype, 3D printed, whatever. Like I said before, you have access to a 3D printer for free at the Lasson Center, so make it take 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 advantage of this. Um, if you do build a prototype, you definitely are welcome to bring it into class and show it, uh, which is highly recommended. Uh, the other option, of course, is that if you, we don't have a sunny day in class, you may also want to do some measurements outside prior to the assigned presentation and take some videos of it and showcase those videos in your in your class. Um, you can also go, you know, that would be really interesting, of course. You can also show some mock-up with detailed drawings. Um, another thing I would highly recommend you to do is also to perform some kind of a simple cost-benefit analysis. Uh, and, and this is relatively straightforward, as we talked about in the last lecture. You can look at the cost of components, cost of labor, cost of, uh, you know, um, maybe marketing and sales as well. And, you know, follow the canvas to some extent. And of course, in each of these uh, items that you will present, make sure you list your assumptions very clearly. So this is, this is probably the most important assignment, uh, technical assignment for this class. And remember, this is the last technical assignment because the fourth assignment is on the business case that you have to make. So uh, I highly, highly recommend that you start working on this right away because this I know would take time. Uh, much more time than you had in your previous two assignments. So although it, all assignments are weighted equally, just keep in mind this, I expect a lot more from you for this particular assignment. Okay, uh, so are there any questions about the assignments? And... Uh, no. Okay, great. So just uh, keep in mind about the announcements. Make sure you meet with your uh, mentors this week and uh, the assignment is still on the 17th. Great, uh, thank you, Noreen, and uh, I will post the video of the lecture uh, later today. Sure. Great, thank you.